Uh, welcome, everybody. Can you hear me? Loud and clear? Uh, I'm Brad Temple from IBM. This is Tan No from IBM and Yin Ding from Huawei. And we're here to talk to you about Kubernetes on OpenStack, what's available and where are the gaps. So just a quick overview uh, why you're going to want to integrate OpenStack and Kubernetes. That's always fun to talk about. We'll then talk about how it's done, what are the integration plug points. Um, and then we'll talk about the different specific pieces of OpenStack that we're leveraging, uh, the identity access management component of, of, of OpenStack, also known as Keystone, uh, networking, uh, many of you know as Neutron, and uh, the storage components, uh, Cinder and Manila. Um, so this is really one of my favorite charts. Uh, so why are we going to integrate uh, Kubernetes with OpenStack? Um, well, let's take a, you know, look at this from both sides. From the Kubernetes side, why are we getting interested in Kubernetes? Well, I've had the pleasure of going to Kubicon in Seattle and in Berlin, and it's an incredibly hot open source community. A lot of energy, a lot of participation, a lot of vendors. Uh, you know, Kubernetes provides a nice, nice usage model with uh, uh, a constraint-based approach with controlling number of replicas, auto scale up, scale down, lots of other features, organizing the pods. So it's really becoming a, a popular approach for managing and scheduling containers across clusters. Um, but if you're going to deploy Kubernetes, you know, if you can go to a public cloud, well, you can go to that. But if you're going to deploy it uh, on-prem, private cloud, uh, well, you're going to need some type of underlying infrastructure to support that. And, uh, you know, or you're going to have to figure out how to do it. So one of the things we'll talk about is why OpenStack is great for that. Uh, ideally, an automated process, which, again, we'll also talk about and, and what you'll need. Um, now let's get to the other part. So we've talked about, you know, put my Kube hat on. Hey, Kube's getting really hot. Now let me put my OpenStack hat on. That's how most of you all know me. OpenStack's a really great platform for deploying Kubernetes. So what does OpenStack have to offer? Well, OpenStack's got some major components, identity, storage, networking, that they've been working on for a long time, and they're very mature. And let me give you an example. Cinder. Anybody know how many different uh, drivers are supported by Cinder? Anybody? It is right at 100. Thank you, sir. You've got 100 drivers in Cinder already there. And you know one of the critical things about having drivers for, uh, for those third-party vendors is, well, how good are they? And how much CI is done? And on those 100, do you know how many uh, all have third-party CI set up for? Anybody? Anybody? All of them. <laughs> so you've got this component sitting there with 100 incredibly well-tested drivers uh, for probably about around 25 vendors. That's the things that folks need for um, you know, stability, make their lives well, sleep at night. And we'll take another quick example. If you look at the identity component of Keystone, um, former PTL over there can't answer. But one of the nice things about uh, Keystone, it started off with um, some basic uh, identity authentication support and very quickly added LDAP support, um, MSAD support, multiple LDAPs. If an insurance company had 25 LDAPs, it could support that as well. And then it moved on to federated identity support. So all of that uh, smarts uh, with SAML and OpenID Connect, all of that already available um, in, 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 in Keystone. And, 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 and so why wouldn't it be great to be able to re reuse all that? And finally, you're going to see areas where uh, folks already have OpenStack deployed. They've already had it connected up to their LDAP, and they've created their groups. And now you come along with Kubernetes. Guess what? Those customers don't want to reset up those groups and reset up everything yet again. So anytime you have one of these situations, whether it's a, you know, we learned this when we were putting Cloud Foundry and OpenStack together. If you're going to put Kubernetes and OpenStack together uh, and have them in the same environment, those folks want to reuse as much as possible. And so that's another reason to, to want to put those things together. So how's it done? Well, 
Kubernetes has a nice plug-in model. Um, they've got this cloud provider interface, and it can work with OpenStack, GCE, AWS, Azure. They're doing a really nice job there. And so there is a place as the different components of Kubernetes want to access storage or networking or authentication type components, there's a nice place uh, where that's encapsulated and where it can be called. And so you'll see there's work done there uh, in, in that cloud provider. And that plugin will, again, support stuff for identity networking and storage. And these guys on stage who are much smarter than me are going to take you through those technical details. And all this code is available. Um, it's, uh, you can go find that, that cloud provider interface in the Kubernetes repo. It also uses a nice SDK, uh, the, the Gopher Cloud, that, that, uh, you know, for, for in, uh, integrating into OpenStack. So you can look at that. Um, and then there's a repo where you can see where it's all uh, provided. And how do we pull this all into, together in OpenStack uh, to make this easy and automated for you to leverage? Um, that's what these guys work on. The Magnum project delivers all that. So why don't we get into the, to the roof stuff? Uh, thank you, Brad. Right, so let's talk about the identity management. Uh, so in a, any system, you, you can expect the uh, identity management to be the key component of uh, that system. So in OpenStack, uh, Keystone provides that service. Uh, so you can expect that Keystone is a pretty robust, uh, it's pretty well integrated and well uh, 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 established in, in the enterprise. And uh, in any system, it will be also be populated with the user base already. Um, you can expect to be in, you know, integrated with a product like LDAP or Microsoft Active Directory. And in some cases, it might be even federated across uh, different organizations. Right, so the, uh, um, for the, in terms of the code, the uh, uh, interface between OpenStack and Kubernetes is in the Gopher Cloud package. Right, uh, so what you have to do before Kubernetes can talk to OpenStack is that the Kubernetes has to authenticate with Keystone to get a session. And uh, to do this, it needs a, a user credential. Right? So what you have to do is uh, uh, in the config file for the uh, uh, plugin, you have to put in your user credential. Right? Um, and then w when once uh, Kubernetes authenticate with OpenStack, it also get along with the authentication or the authorization for the user account. So we get all the quota or the, you know, what, what service you can access to. Right? And in fact, this is where uh, multi-tenancy, you know, uh, come into the picture. Um, now, the, the config file is a plain text file. So uh, if you are concerned about security, because you, you, you might be running container on the same host, uh, then a better approach is to use uh, Keystone trust, trust. So with the Keystone Trust, then you uh, can limit the, uh, the scope of that trust uh, and, and to, to a, a much smaller scope. For instance, you can uh, define the scope to work only for the Kubernetes endpoint. That way, if uh, the trust is compromised for some reason, then the security exposure is not, not too bad. Right? Um, so when we um, use Magnum to build a Kubernetes cluster, then all this is automated by uh, 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 Magnum, and it just, just works. Okay. Looking to, to uh, the future, then, you can start in the last talk that multi-tenancy is coming to uh, uh, Kubernetes, uh, probably in, in, in the, um, later this year. So there's still a concern about whether uh, we have enough isolation between container for different tenants. But anyway, if uh, uh, when we have that multi-tenancy support in Kubernetes, then, then uh, it would be good. It would be natural to ask whether it makes that sense to use Keystone uh, you know, in Kubernetes to manage the identity. All right. So next, we'll talk about networking. Networking is pretty complicated. Uh, so there are many ways to, to implement networking. So what I show here is a, a one way to do this. It's not the only way, so for sure. Uh, but when you run kube control to, let's say, launch a part, you know, uh, uh, that part can go through the networking uh, layer to talk to any other part in the cluster. Right. So here you can see uh, what, I'm, what I have here is uh, the part. Uh, on the left side, being connected to a VETH uh, interface to a bridge, and then from bridge it go to the, uh, the network interface of the host, and then there from there it go out to the, the network, and then get routed to uh, another host where the other part reside, and then you go, you know, from that, that's how it get to the other part, right? Um, if you run kube control to say expose a service, right? Uh, 
uh, what happened there is that the Kubernetes would talk to the cloud layer to get the load balancer and a floating IP so that uh, you know, uh, your service is now accessible from outside the, uh, the, the cluster. So what I've done here is that I, I kind of grouped them into three groups, roughly based on uh, how they are, uh, they are implemented. And I'll go into each of those uh, in detail in the next couple of slides. So first, the uh, network interface. Right? So what you have to do here when you create a part or delete a part is to uh, uh, set up the network interface so that that part can talk to the rest of the network. Uh, this is done by the kubelet uh, running on each other node. And uh, you can tell kubelet the, the network driver that you want to use to do all those setup. Right, uh, right now, there are two ways to do this. Uh, there one option is the kubenet. Uh, so kubenet gives you the, the very basic uh, uh, network configuration where the parts are connected to a bridge, and then from bridge, you go out to the, ne the network. So that's the, the simplest uh, basic you know, uh, implementation. Uh, another way is to use a CNI driver. CNI driver is basically a, uh, a piece of code that implements the, the container network interface uh, spec. Right? And there are many of these that, that are available. So for OpenStack, the Courier team built a CNI driver uh, that, that you can plug in. Right? Uh, and what you get with that driver is that uh, um, uh, you get a, a native Neutron support in your Kubernetes. So what happened there is that the, the, the node where you, the uh, VM is running would have a trunk port, uh, a neutron trunk port, and when the part is created, then uh, the, the career CNI driver would uh, create a VIF uh, on the part and then connect stretch directly to the trunk port. So you have a pretty simple, you know, nice, simple interface. So the, the advantage here is that being all neutron, you, know, you can uh, now leverage all the uh, network driver that come with neutron that come from the other network uh, provider. So that, that's a nice, you know, uh, nice thing to leverage. The, the other advantage is that, uh, uh, again, since it's a uh, straight neutron uh, uh, private network, you can put VM on it. And that VM would, you know, would be able to access all the part. You have VM and part living on the same, uh, same network. Uh, Looking into the future, the career team is working on improving the performance for all this setup, so it can get, come out fast, faster, and perform better, things like that. Now, one thing I want to note is that uh, uh, this kind of network setup is still uh, in alpha phase, so, so we can expect a lot of change in the next, uh, you know, uh, in the new, new future. So that take care of the setup, the network interface. The next step is uh, to take care of the routing. Right? So once you get out to the network, how do you get to the uh, the, the host. So the re requirement here is that any part has to be able to reach, reach any other part. Yeah. Uh, so the, uh, this routing is set up when you build a cluster. Uh, do you take care of all the uh, configuration and so on and to set up the routing? And uh, it also happens when you add an, a new node to your cluster. So that, that's kind of like in the in infrastructure, infrastructure layer of the, uh, the, the cluster. So to get this kind of routing, uh, one simple way is to use an overlay network, uh, like uh, Flannel or Calico and so on. So, so once with, with that overlay network, then all we have to do is attach the part on, onto the overlay network, and then you know, the overlay uh, take care of all the routing for you, no matter what the node are. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is the, the overhead for the encapsulation. Um, in a talk in Tokyo, we, we, did the, we showed some performance measurement of you know, what the overlay network would cost you. And it is uh, pretty significant. And uh, now the good news is that uh, for uh, Neutron, for, for our cluster here, um, if you have all your node running on the same L2 network, then uh, Flannel has a mode called host gateway where it, it actually uh, avoids the encapsulation and, and just uh, create the IP rule, uh, IP rule to, to route, do the routing for you. So, so with that, then the performance is quite good. Uh, you, it's good enough to, to use Flano in production. So uh, looking at the future, uh, we know that uh, with the Google Cloud Engine, uh, they have native routing you know, in, in their uh, fabric so that uh, all the routing happen, you know, uh, automatically you, need to, you don't need overlay or anything like that. So we do have neutron routing also, so it would be natural to to look into whether we can do the same thing 
uh, as a Google Cloud Engine. And I think the query team is uh, working on this as well. Right. Okay, right, third, uh, we look at the external access, right? So why, we did, why do we need this? So we know that uh, when you have an app running on, on a, a pod, you, know, you don't want to use the pod IP to access the app because the, you know, the pod is not uh, stable. It, it might die and, and come back and go to a different IP. So what you have to do is uh, uh, create a service so that you can get a stable IP in front of that, that part. Right? Now, the service does have a load balancing you know, uh, mechanism, mechanism in, inside it so that it can load balance against all the part behind it. Uh, but the problem is that the IP for the service is still local to your crystal network. It's not visible outside. So if you want you know, to get in from the outside and, and then get to your app, then, then you need you know, more support. Uh, so, and this is where the uh, the uh, load balancer from the cloud come in. Um, the plugin for the uh, uh, Kubernetes on stack, Kubernetes would talk to OpenStack and uh, you know, uh, uh, request the uh, load balancer uh, for you. So that, that, you know, that can get automated. The plugin code right now supports both uh, LBAS version one and two. And uh, if you, again, if you use Magnum to build your uh, Kubernetes cluster, then all this is automated also, it just, it just works. So for the future consideration, uh, the code for, for the plugin is fairly complete you know, in terms of supporting the load balancer, but there's a few things that we can, we can add to around now the support. Uh, we can add support for region. Right now, it only supports the uh, uh, current region. Right? Uh, we can also add automation for flow to IP, so, th so that you know, that will help you a little bit of also. You can see that in the demo. Um, so with that, let me pause and, and show you a quick demo. This is a recorded demo. And, uh, um, okay. So what I have here is I use Magnum uh, to build a small Kubernetes cluster with just you know, one master and two nodes. Um, so it built pretty quickly. It's about, just take about a minute. Uh, this is just dev stack from codes from master about a week ago. Right. So, so do a cluster list, and you see the, uh, the, the, the cluster that might have created. Right? You have uh, one master and two nodes here. And if we look, look at, at the Nova instance, we have uh, three Nova instances here. Right, uh, so now we don't have any load balancer yet. It's all empty. <laughs> if we look at the load balancer, and if you look at the uh, floating IP, right now I have three floating IP, one for each of the Nova instance. So that's the initial setup, you know, when you, when you create the, uh, the, uh, the cluster. So what I do now is uh, I'll uh, you know, do kube control to uh, start up uh, two instances of the Nginx two part in, in, uh, in a deployment, right? Okay. So that's those part are coming up. So uh, here's a detail of, uh, of, of uh, those two parts. And then what I'll do next is uh, to run a cube, another kube control uh, command to uh, create a service. Right? And uh, these are services that I, where I would re request the uh, load balancer. Right? So you can see that here, uh, the service come up, the, but the external, you get the uh, cluster IP, which is internal to the, 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 the network and then you have the external IP, and that's still pending, because uh, if you go back to the OpenStack side, you see that the uh, uh, load balancer is being created. So it's it take a little while for that to come up, and then eventually um, you get the uh, uh, load balancer running, and now you have the external IP, which, uh, which is the IP for the load balancer. That's a 10.0.0.11. So once this comes up uh, on the upper stack side, you can also see a whole bunch of uh, resource that uh, get created uh, alongside with the load balancer. You get a pool, and you get the, the member of the pool, which are the two nodes of your cluster. You get your listener, and you get your health monitor for the uh, load balancer. So all those get created by the plugin code. Okay. 
So now it would not quite done yet because the, the IP for that load balancer is still an internal IP. It's, uh, it's, sti it's live on the, uh, the uh, uh, network cluster. So now what I have to do to get it outside is to, to associate a uh, uh, floating IP to it. So what I just did in the previous slide is to create a floating IP. Okay. Now I go back to the load balancer and I'm going to uh, associate that my floating IP to the load balancer. Right. So I look for the uh, VIP for of the load balancer and I do the uh, floating point IP, floating IP associate. So this is part that, you know, right now we still have to do manually, but uh, we can imagine adding this support to the plugin so that uh, it's happened automatically. Right. So now you see that the floating IP that I just created is associated with the uh, load balancer, and then we can do a curl on, the, on that IP, and we get the default page for the uh, internet. Uh, that comes straight from the part. All right, so that's a quick short demo to show you how you know, Kubernetes is, uh, is uh, talking to OpenStack and, and you know, working together. So with that, let me pass to my colleague, Ian. He will talk about uh, uh, volume. Okay. Hi. Uh, now it's uh, my turn talking about uh, storage. So uh, during last year in Barcelona, I talking about the uh, how we use the uh, Fuji plugin to connect the uh, Kubernetes to Cinder and uh, other stuff. So here I gave a uh, more detailed chart. So you can see the client talk to Kubernetes master. Then you t Kubernetes master go to the agent and talk to Kubelet, and Kubelet talk to our driver. Then we can pick a what to connect next, either in the, uh, in the bare metal case, in the VM case a little more complicated. You need to connect both Cinder and Nova. Uh, I, I can show you what the next, in the next slide, a little bit more detail. So with this, using the Cinder volume, let's say we support multiple different storage drivers and from different vendors, so it solves a lot of problems. You don't need to write individual drivers for your uh, container cluster. And also, uh, you can pick your choice, say, I only want to connect to individual drivers directly. It's, it's also working. And also, with this Fushi plugin, you can uh, connect to the raw device directly. So then you do the formatting and whatever you want to do with this storage. And uh, I'm talking about here, in t as uh, Brad mentioned in the opening talk, say, uh, integrating with Cinder is giving the users very, a lot of convenience and a wide range of uh, storage options, so you don't need to write your own drivers and you'll get this uh, benefit automatically. So now I'm going a little bit of detail, say, uh, what's the performance? Uh, after last year, we talked about the uh, uh, Fushi uh, how they connect to the volume, we find out, we solve the problem, say, connect storage from OpenStack to the uh, orchestration of the container. However, we observe a little bit uh, performance issues, say, okay, is that slow? So here I give a detailed uh, code chart, say, what's happening behind the scene. So you can see uh, when you call, say, attach a volume, uh, create a volume and attach it, so what's behind, what's the sequence of the operation? First, you call the uh, Cinder volume, say, uh, RESTful call, say, create volume. And behind the scene, uh, Cinder talk to NOAA, say, and fetch this volume information, and NOAA get to the connection, connector information, then NOAA call Cinder, say, okay, you need this connection, and call storage Stafel, st uh, RESTful API to do the volume mapping, and then NOAA use this uh, lib virtual iSCSI volume driver, and that's method called uh, connect volume. And the let hold to scan this disk and do the uh, initial formatting, then attach this volume to the host. And then Nova call Cinder API to attach this volume to finish the volume status. So that's our observation. So I set up a, a small environment, uh, about eight, 
for 8 GB, uh, the A1 stack is about 24 cores and 24 GB uh, memory, and the host is about 8 core and 8 GB each. So th the command I run is uh, Docker run, volume driver, Fushi, uh, and to connect this. Uh, in this test case, I already pulled the image back, so the time span, it doesn't include any Docker pull from, pull the image from the uh, Docker Hub. It's pure uh, analysis about the, this plugin performance. So you can see the one, two, three, four, five, six. I highlight some uh, numbers in this chart. So the longest time we spend in the, is the back to the previous slides is number five, the host attached volume. So this one is related to the top volume size. The bigger the volume is, the, the longer time you spend on this operation. And the second one is in the, the crit volume call is about 1.5 seconds. You can see speed uh, in here. And the third longest time you will spend is this uh, volume wrapping in the uh, number four is it's about uh, 0.7 second average. So uh, this raises a question, say, can this plug-in operation keep up the speed of the uh, container cluster? Because we average, I think average uh, container life lifespan is less than 20 seconds. So we spend about eight seconds here to the uh, volume. And it apparently slow down the performance. So here we say how we improve this performance. So uh, we can see uh, the Kubernetes introduced a PV and a PVC mechanism. So basically, it, it allow you to create a pres uh, persistent volume in a head. So you don't need to spend this time to waiting for the create volume call. So it save about three quarters of time is spent here. Yeah, but it's still about two seconds spent on a mounted volume to the container. So, but, but in, in the bare metal case, we don't need to talk to Nova. We can use Cinder directly to talk to the uh, volume. Actually, this performance got improved a lot. So in the bare metal case, in the much better performance. Then um, I, I don't have demo here, but I can show we also tried to use Manila to do a file system. So basically, uh, it's a file stage can help you. So in the share storage, we using Manila to create a share uh, mount point. So then the PVC, the performance is in the VM case, the virtual machine case, is much faster. So uh, probably next time, if I have more time, I will show a demo to show this. And let's do a quick demo. So here, this first demo is show the uh, a Cinder plugin cases. You can see initially there's a no Cinder volume, then we create one. Now we can see we create a new Cinder volume. And we use this ID, we put it in the Kubernetes uh, YAML file, and we replace here. Then we create a Kubernetes cluster, use a Kubernetes control. Now you can see the pod is uh, creating and created, and we can see this cinder is a volume is attached as in use. So now we just use Nova to find out the host that we are using to host this container. Now we just, here we are trying to connect to the host, connect the container and show what exactly, uh, I mean, actually the volume is attached to the container. Here is the container ID. We log into the container, use the Docker command. Yep, here, so yeah, here. Yeah, we can see here the uh, container is a, a mounted this volume in use in this directory as we did. We specified. Now we delete this part. We show 
the PV and the PVC cases. Now you can see the cinder volume is available. So this is the PVC cases. <coughs> so we are going to mount the uh, volume in that directory inside the container. Now we created a pod, the pod. Yeah, it's take about 30 seconds. So the pod is uh, bringing up the container, it's running. So we can see this is the PVC volume. And this is a one gig as we uh, specified. Here is the cinder volume, it's in use. So that's the case. Uh, let me show. Let me show another one is the, to support my cases. Oops. So here I show you the performance, what's going on for this uh, Fushi plugin, as I mentioned, how many times. It, it's, it's about one minute. I just want to show you the, the feeling. You can see here we create volume. It takes about uh, a few seconds. So we uh, create one as a device here. And then we try to mount this to the VM. Yeah, here you can see as the mount take about less than a second. However, the uh, that create take about two or three seconds. So I just say we can operate on this volume. Now you can see even the detach take uh, some time because. We need to give the information to NOAA, <laughs> this communication. Take some time. Yeah, now it's deleted, so. So it's got deleted, but uh, you can see it's take a few seconds. So now I'm talking about a little bit more advanced uh, topics. So uh, initially when the container I introduced, we talking about say, okay, that the state is ser microservices, but now, now when the containers are well used, people talking about, uh, we need some stateful container and we need to protect the data. So here I'm talking about the potential work we are uh, investigating to integrate our effort with uh, Kaba. Kaba. Kaba is the uh, OpenStack project is focusing on product data and the metadata uh, for the application. So it provides a standard framework API and the services so we can uh, integrate our vendor mechanism and to protect and unify the workflow for the users. So with this, we can provide a snapshot and the replication. The snapshot in the uh, uh, Kubernetes uh, storage SIG, we were talking about uh, by next week, we are going to release an alpha, alpha version of a snap, snapshot API. So snapshot is really useful uh, for rolling back or uh, upgrade cases. So in the uh, stateless cases, so for the container, when do the upgrade, we just uh, upgrade directly. If it's something going wrong, we just roll back and kill the uh, the new version and roll back to the old version. However, in the stateful cases, we cannot do this because uh, the data may be changed, the metadata may be changed, so it's not compatible with the previous version. So what we do is say, okay, we need to take a snapshot first, then we do the upgrade, 
if something wrong, we need to roll back to the previous version of the containers or container clusters. We attach the, uh, we roll back to the uh, snapshot we took and attach them back to the container. It's ensure it's, uh, data is compatible with your services. For the replication, uh, it's basically uh, it's trying to protect from uh, any hardware failure or network failures. So when you disconnect it with your storage, is in the stateful cases is uh, is disaster. So that's why we trying to integrate the, the cobble to using this replication data uh, mechanism to replicate your data. So we are able to recover even we have a hardware failure or storage failure. So uh, the Fushi we are talking about uh, putting in another effort we are working on with OpenSCS. So OpenSCS is focusing as how uh, Kubernetes with OpenStack and other uh, infrastructure layer. So we can do uh, so storage discovery. So basically you can put in your, bring your new storage. This uh, OpenSCS controller try to do the uh, scan and discover and add your storage to the existing storage cluster and do some lifecycle management for your storage and provide the data protection as we mentioned. So Fushi basically will become the first layer as a plugin layer for the OpenSCS project. So what in blue is uh, OpenSCS, OpenSCS, uh, the top layer is a plugin basically talking to uh, uh, connect to the uh, orchestration, or container orchestration layer. Then the controller is the core, so it's do the uh, storage discovery uh, backup snapshot, something like that. Then we have the driver we can connect to uh, Cinder driver, Manila driver, and also other storage. So here is uh, some information, the, the links. And let's get back to Brad. All right, thank to you, Ian. Closing. Sure. So what have we done? We presented how OpenStack, it's an excellent IaaS option for Kubernetes. It provides you multi-tenancy, uh, good efficient utilization of resources, um, gives you lots of storage driver options and lots of uh, authentication federated identity options, lots of things going on, all of this out of the box. Um, really what you're looking at, and the theme here is, is looking at great open source technologies, uh, open source communities, and combining them to give folks like you the best of breed option. Um, that's what we're focused on. Um, it's active development. We've looked at the different code and where the different pieces are and where they fit together. And there's more work to be done, of course, and um, uh, there's more improvements that are possible in the near future. So on that note, uh, we're happy to take questions. Don't be afraid. I think it's scary out there. Try being up here in front of all of you. People know we are. Oh, yeah. Thank you. There's a mic right behind you, Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Yes. Uh, I have a question with regards to uh, load balancing. I mean, I was kind of curious. What was the reason to use LBUS um, where the Kubernetes already providing you load balancing, so it's kind of redundant? And it seems much simpler solution just to pass the floating IP to the Kubernetes so it would use it as external and perfectly do the load balancing. Right. So. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, so th this is something we, uh, so, so uh, there are two part of us. The, the first thing is that the, the service, like as I mentioned, does do some load balancing with it. So, so that happened uh, within the, the internal network of Kubernetes. So, so what happens is that then, you know, uh, if you have a, a part, that access that service, and behind that service is a bunch of other parts, then that, that service would do the load balancing for you. That, but that's only internal. There's no way for, uh, uh, to get in to, to see that service. But I guess so your question is whether to just attach the floating IP to the service. Uh, so we can't quite do that. And uh, there's, there's a long, uh, uh, if you look at the, the uh, discussion on the uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, discussion, that, that, that there has been discussion on that. And when we start doing this, we also ask that question to the, the Kubernetes sign, and it's not quite, we can't quite do that. Yeah. Thank you. Right. 
Anything else? Going once? All right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.